If you're already familiar with Elasticsearch and just looking to get up to speed on what's new in Elasticsearch 7, here's an overview of the main changes. Elasticsearch tends to roll out big new features even within minor releases, so this isn't everything that's new since Elasticsearch 6.0 necessarily, but a lot of features introduced within the 6.x run have been declared production ready with Elasticsearch 7. For a while now, Elasticsearch has been in a long process of deprecating the concept of types. It used to be that in addition to documents and indices, there was also a type that allowed you to associate different schemas with documents within the same index. Conceptually, they found this to be a bad idea, as it made people think types work the same as a database table, when in reality they behave differently. You'll find that some APIs that used to take a type name now use a generic type called underscore doc instead, and others just omit the type parameter entirely now. Configuration files and plugins that used to require types to be specified no longer do. This is really the most pervasive change to Elasticsearch, and it's what required us to re-record this entire course when Elasticsearch 7 came out. The change I'm most excited about personally is the official release of SQL support in Elasticsearch. We've added a lecture and a hands-on activity for this later in the course so you can get familiar with it. But it really couldn't be much easier. You can now query your Elasticsearch index using the same SQL syntax you probably already know. SQL seems to be the lingua franca that's tying together all sorts of big data technologies, and Elasticsearch is falling in line with that. There have been a lot of changes to the default configuration settings for Elasticsearch, especially as they relate to the number of default shards, which is now one instead of five, and how replication works. In a production setting though, you really should be tuning these values yourself anyhow. They've updated to the latest version of Lucene under the hood. Really, Elasticsearch is just a distributed version of Lucene with various layers added on top of it. Some add-ons that used to be installed separately from Elasticsearch are now included with it by default. They seem to be moving away from the concept of a separate package of add-ons to the open source version of Elasticsearch, which is called XPack, toward making those add-ons open source themselves, but only enabling certain features if you purchase an enterprise license for Elasticsearch. You no longer need to install a specific version of Java before installing Elasticsearch, as it comes with one of its own now. However, other components of the Elastic stack, such as Kibana, will still need an external JDK. Replication across clusters is now possible in ES7. There's also a new feature called Index Lifecycle Management, or ILM. This is pretty cool stuff. It automates the progression of your data through a lifecycle, through hot, warm, cold, and deletion phases. This can be really useful to automatically moving log data into read-only, less expensive storage over time, and ultimately deleting it once it's no longer required to be retained. We'll cover this in more depth later in the course. There is also a new Java client for Elasticsearch that they're quite proud of. If you're a Java developer, you'll definitely want to check it out. But we're going to keep things at a lower level within this course and interact with Elasticsearch via the underlying RESTful queries. Not only does that keep what you're learning language agnostic, it will help you to understand what's going on at a lower level, even if you choose to later use a higher level API such as HLRC. There are also countless performance improvements and small little breaking changes, all of which I'll refer you to the documentation for. There are a few other smaller features that have rolled out as well, but these are the ones I'm most excited about.